you may be wondering what type of materials you'll need for this course. Now I'm going to consider the course uh, in two different places, at home and in class. Now at home, each student needs to have some way to watch the lectures. I'm going to put these lectures, these 144 lectures for a gross of physics, on YouTube. I'm going to have a link through a website. And for those students who may not have internet access at home, I hope to put them on one or two flash drives. I'm hoping that I could fit the entire course onto one 8 gig flash drive, but if it takes 16, we're going to put them on 16 gigabytes worth of storage, and I'll allow students to take them home um, and download them to their computer at home. The important aspect is that many of us at this point have uh, Wi-Fi access at home or data plans for our phones where we can watch video um, and listen to audio uh, even um, at any place at any time. So I'm going to assume that a student has a computer at home or even an Xbox 360 or a PS3 because I know many of my students uh, play video games. Well the Xbox can play video files. The PS3 can play video files. And if you put a, a flash drive, a USB flash drive, into the device, you can watch the videos through that on the big TV. Um, if the students have an iPad or an iPod or a tablet of some sort, they should be able to access YouTube and watch the videos from there. This is something that students can do um, alone with headphones on. This could be something that's done in the living room with uh, other family members. Some students have older brothers and sisters that I've taught. Some students will have younger brothers and sisters that I will teach. Some have parents that have never taken a physics course. Um, some have parents that have gone through higher levels of physics than I could even uh, discuss. What I think this can be is more of a um, group effort even at home. Parents who want to know what their students are learning about in physics can watch the videos as well. Um, during class, we're going to explore physics as a learning community. Uh, 30 students or so will work on problems together. But at home, it's important to get some of the basic understanding of the material. Some of my students have study halls that they'll be able to go to the library and watch the video for the next day. Or if they have a late class, they'll be able to watch the video for today uh, during a study hall. The bottom line is that I want to make this course accessible to students at whatever time they um, can watch them and whatever time is conducive for them to take some notes. The notes will be handed to students that I teach in class um, in a packet, but I'm going to have the uh, scaffolded notes available online as well. And we'll just have to go to the website to download that material. While the lectures are being uh, watched, um, they can be paused so that the notes can be uh, written down for each uh, page of the PowerPoint and uh, then can be unpaused to continue. If a student needs to go over a certain section again and again and again to really understand the material, uh, they'll have the ability to do that. I plan on putting a number of practice problems uh, within the videos as well. And that will allow us to uh, have students try and ultimately succeed in proper problem solving. I will model the problem solving for the students, but it's really important for each student to uh, develop their own methodology for problem solving throughout the course. As far as uh, other equipment that will be needed, other materials, it's important that each student has a scientific or graphing calculator available. These uh, will be important when we do quantitative solutions to problems. Uh, not every problem will require uh, calculators, but it's important to understand how the calculator works. We'll need a calculator that can do squares, that can do square roots, that can do exponents, and that can handle scientific notation. Um, as well as trigonometry. So they'll, they'll need to have a calculator that has a sine, cosine, tangent function. 
um, as well as an inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent function. Students who are not strong in trigonometry will become stronger in trigonometry because of this course. Students who are not strong in algebra will get better algebraic skills through this course. Um, it's important to realize that physics utilizes mathematics as part of its language. Um, we have terminology for the concepts, but we'll also use mathematics to describe uh, motion and energy and impulses uh, more clearly. I believe that the other material that a student will have is every student is going to need to know how to read and understand the physics reference table. For the New York State course, uh, there's a physics reference table that has a number of sections included on it. Um, I'm going to go through those sections briefly now. Not every part will be understandable at this point to the students, but I just want them to be aware of the sections of the reference table and what types of information will be um, available on it. Now what I have here is my reference table. Um, this is the uh, older edition. It's a 2006 edition, um, which is the edition that we're currently using uh, in, in the high school physics course. If that is updated, we'll have to update our reference table to accommodate as well. Now there are a number of sections for the reference table. The first section is the front page, the front cover, and that has all of the constants that will be useful in physics. Constants such as the acceleration of gravity, universal gravitational constant, the speed of light, uh, the mass of the electron, um, the electrostatic constant, and even the speed of sound. Um, these constants will be useful for students uh, during different topics. Now, if we flip the reference table over, there is a list of all equations from the mechanics section of the course. The mechanics section um, involves all the motion, energy, forces, um, circular motion, gravitational forces and attractions, as well as momentum and impulse. And that section um, covers a good section of the course in terms of time. And like I said before, we'll probably cover about half the course. Um, motion and mechanics is a big portion of the course and really where we develop proper problem solving skills. If we flip back to the front cover, there are two um, sections that are listed. Uh, one is the prefixes. Students are expected to understand scientific prefixes such as the centi, the milli, the kilo, um, the giga, the mega. Um, and each one of these represents a power of 10 to each unit. For example, a centimeter would be 10 to the negative 2 meters. A millimeter would be 10 to the negative 3 meters. It lists on that chart the symbol and what each symbol represents and, and the common name for the symbol. The only one that's not a letter uh, in the English language is the mu, which is a micro and it's 10 to the negative 6. And that's listed on that chart as well. Most students find micro to be the one that's the most difficult because it's the only Greek letter in the prefixes. Now, uh, next to that section is the coefic coefficients of friction. Those values allow us to calculate how much friction will exist between two surfaces as they slide together. It will also allow us to calculate how uh, much, much friction will be available before an object begins to move at all. There are two types of friction. There's static and kinetic, and different um, combinations of surfaces have values on that chart that are listed. It lists everything from uh, rubber on ice to wax skis on snow to tires on concrete or asphalt um, and even steel on uh, another piece of steel rubbing together or possibly uh, Teflon rubbing on a piece of Teflon. Teflon is typically the surface that is sprayed onto um, the no stick cooking surfaces. In addition to those charts which is the front and back cover we have a number of other um, charts or pieces of information. 
On the inside of the front cover, there is the electromagnetic spectrum. It lists all the different forms of light, from gamma radiation to ultraviolet to visible light to x-rays and radio waves. Um, it lists a general range for each in terms of frequencies and wavelengths, and it also lists the color of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet, um, in order to show how small the range of visible light is compared to the full spectrum of light. Each form of light can travel through space. And one of the biggest misconceptions, just to try to get that out of the way now, is that radio waves are a form of light. They are not sound waves. The radio waves can travel through space, but sound waves cannot. Sound waves need a material in which to travel through. So if we evacuated all the sound from a container, made a, a vacuum, and put a bell in that vacuum, we wouldn't be able to hear the sound of the bell. However, we could take a radio signal and send it through that vacuum, and it would pass through uh, unimpeded. So the different types of electromagnetic radiation, which we call light, are listed on the chart as well. Underneath that, on the same page, are uh, listings for indices of refraction, or what we call the index of refraction for different materials. The index of refraction is a measure of how light travels, the speed of the light, within material medium. Although light can travel through space, it does slow down when it reaches um, uh, other materials, such as water, such as plastic, such as glass, um, even diamond. So we'll talk about the indices of refraction as well. And sometimes students need to be able to find this information. It's on the reference table on the inside of the front cover. On the other side of that, um, we have, if we flip open again, we end up looking at the middle of the reference table. And this reference table is when it's printed as a trifold. There is a large piece of paper that is folded in twice onto itself. And the inside cover, like I said, had the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. And now if we flip again, we have the, the true center of the reference table, which lists the energy level diagrams. Students coming from chemistry will recognize the different jumps um, of energy levels for electrons within the hydrogen atom. We call them the shells or principal energy levels, and each level releases or absorbs a certain amount of energy. When electrons jump from higher to lower energy levels, they release light, and we're able to figure out the type of light, the frequency of light, and possibly the color of the light if it's in the visible spectrum based on those numbers. Those numbers are listed in electron volts, and one of the constants on the front cover of the reference table lists the conversion from electron volts to joules. Students from chemistry probably stuck with electron volts as their major unit. In here, we're using the metric unit of joules for energy, and we're going to need to be able to convert from one to the other. In addition to the hydrogen um, energy levels, there is the mercury atom as well. So we have two atoms. Uh, listed in terms of their energy levels. And then we move into um, sub subatomic particles such as quarks, um, leptons, and then we classify matter in different methods. When we talk about this topic, we're talking about modern physics, and that will be something that's covered much later in the course. In terms of the reference table, we will not use that middle of the reference table, the center, if you will until much later in the course. But I want students to be um, cognizant of the fact that a lot of that is chemistry, and those who um, are taking physics after chemistry will find some solace in the fact that the chemistry will um, be discussed as well, especially for the students who enjoyed chemistry. Now, after that, um, if we go to the next inside of the reference table, there is an entire section on electricity and all the equations that deal with electricity, from static electricity to current electricity. It lists the types of circuits. It even has um, different circuit symbols for when we draw circuit diagrams. It has symbols for batteries, for resistors, for lamps. It even has symbols for variable resistors and some of the meters that are used to measure things such as voltage and current in the circuit. Students will be expected throughout the course uh, when we talk about electricity, to be able to draw a diagram of a series circuit or a parallel circuit. 
and we'll talk about the differences between them and how to calculate um, different values within each circuit. Voltages, currents, and resistance being the, the major three. As far as the elect electricity section, there is also a chart of resistivities. We could find the resistance of different materials based upon what they're made of. Um, in this chart, aluminum, copper, gold, nichrome, silver, and tungsten are listed. Tungsten happens to be the filament in most light bulbs. We have silver and copper, gold because certain wires or connections or components are made from these materials and they have different values for resistance. The values for resistivity are based upon the material themselves. The resistance is based on not only the material but the shape or geometry of the material. Now as we continue with the reference table we see um, different sections of the course. There's the waves and optics section which lifts different um, equations for speed of light in materials, index of refraction, we have Snell's law, we even have the relationship between wavelength and frequency for different materials as light enters a new um, boundary. For example, from air into water or from water into glass, like in an aquarium, um, that would be listed as well. Underneath the section of waves and optics, we have modern physics, and there are three equations that are typically used. Uh, there are more than that before quantitative results, we're going to want to stick to the three equations for energy of the photon, for Einstein's equation converting energy and matter equals mc squared, and even determining the energy of a photon within the atom as it jumps from different energy levels. Underneath that is for students who may uh, be hesitant in trigonometry or geometry. It lists areas for different shapes namely the triangle, the rectangle, and the circle, um, and lists the trig functions for sine, cosine, and tangent. It also lists Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Most students should not need to use this section of the reference table when we get to the Regents examination, but for those who panic and those who um, want to double check what the equation for sine is, for example, sine equals opposite of hypotenuse, um, they can use that section of the chart. Uh, that is useful for many of the equations where geometry is important for determining physical characteristics of, for example, the resistor or other calculations such as that. Now finally, um, as I stated before, we have the mechanics section on the back cover. Um, if the reference table is, is unopened, the front page has all the constants, the back page has all the equations that we'll use for uh, many weeks into the course. So for the first, um, we'll say about half of the course, there will be no need to really flip into the reference table um, at all. If we leave it on our tables unopened and we look at the front cover for our constants and our prefixes and we flip it to the back cover for our equations, we should be in good shape. Um, if we do panic, though, we can remember that the area um, and trig functions are also included within the uh, confines of the reference table. And that concludes an overview of the reference table for now. A lot of information is, has, was just given, um, and it's important to realize that uh, we'll cover all, every one of these equations, every one of these constants over the course of the next 144 days. Thank you.